Amen, amen. Come on, put your hands together and you may be seated. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, welcome to the crossroads. I thank God for all of you that are here today. Please keep in prayer. We have many families that reached out to me and said, hey, we're going on vacation. We're going here. We're going there. And that's great. You didn't take me with you, but I understand, you know, traveling mercies for you all that are traveling and may God bring you back home safely. Now we're going to be going today to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, but I have to share with you all, if you weren't here last week, or if you didn't watch online, you missed out on an incredible service. Amen. We had an incredible service. We had one of our own Impact Youth Ministry uh, teenagers, Ethan, he shared the word. He actually came and he preached. And I tell you that the word that came forth was amazing. It was awesome. Ethan did an incredible job. Uh, I thank God for what God's doing in him and what God's going to continue to do in him. Now, many of you probably don't realize that something else took place last week. Last week was our three-year anniversary. We were incorporated as Crossroads Christian Community Church three years ago. Now, it's a short time for many churches, but I thank God what, for what he's doing here because we've been on an incredible journey. We've been on an incredible journey. We've been through many ups, many, many ups. I mean, we've had incredible testimonies. Terry shared one last week. And we've also dealt with our downs, but God has showed himself to be true throughout it all. I don't know if you all realize, so I got to tell you like this. You're sitting in a modern-day miracle. If you believe that God doesn't do miracles, well, you're sitting in one right now because God has been doing so many things here in and through the church that it's beyond the ordinary. It's supernatural what God's been doing and what's been taking place here. And the key thing about it is that he chose you all, you all, not me, you all to be a part of it. Your crossroads. So come on, let's celebrate. Happy anniversary to you because we're in this together. That's a key word today, together. So I'm believing that God will speak to everyone's heart today, that he'll speak to you and that you begin to realize what an incredible part of history you are and will continue to be. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I gave you time to look it up or to them to put it up here behind me. So let's go to the book of Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 to be in fact, uh, for that matter. I don't know if they're ready for two. I kind of added to it. So it says... Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God." Father, thank you for your word. Bless us during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, when many read and consider this scripture, you know, I did the same. You focus on the race. You focus on the race. You focus on the fact that it says, you know, you got to have endurance. So you look at the race and others focus on the fact and they'll say things like, hey, realize that it's not a sprint that it's a marathon. So this is a race that we have to be a part of and consider that it's something that we come quick to realize that it's an individual run, or that's what we think it is, that it's an individual run. But when you read the verbiage, you realize that there's something different about it because it's not an individual run, and that's the same thing we do with regarding our Christianity. We consider our Christianity as something that we do on our own. We look at it like, okay, God told me, he, or he told me to do this, he blessed me with this talent, and I'm going to go out and do what I need to do alone. You know, I could be alone. I could do it from home. I don't need to come together. I don't need to assemble with my brothers and sisters. But that concept of doing that race on your own and not worrying about somebody else you know, it does something, and here, like I said in the scripture, we're being taught something else. So I want you to understand that we have to gain insight to what the scripture is saying, but in order to do so, we also have to consider Hebrews 11. We have to consider Hebrews 11. That's why they say you look at the context of the biblical scriptures, and when you look at Hebrews 11, for those of you that don't know, it's considered the hall of faith. You hear about so many people and the great faith that they had, but if we look at verse 30 
of chapter 11, and then you look at verse 1 of chapter 12, you see what's being revealed right before our eyes. So in verse 40, it says, Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together, there's that word together again, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. And then Hebrews 12, 1 says, Therefore, Therefore, so it's a continuation of what was previously said. That word therefore actually means for that reason, for that reason. So when it continues to instruct us about running a race, when it continues to instruct us about laying weights aside, about laying sins aside, about keeping our eyes on Jesus, when it continues to do so, it's saying that we need to do so in the same manner of those that are considered to have great faith in Hebrews 11. It's saying that we need to consider it as those. So yes, we're part of an ongoing race. Yes, we are. But it's not an individual race. It's not an individual race. We're part of a relay race. Oh boy, you've never heard that term before with scripture. It's part of a relay race. It's not something that we do individual. And as mentioned in Hebrews 11, there are others that have come before us. They've come before us and only together it says it. Only together can it be perfect. Only together can it be perfect. And when you consider that you're part of a relay, now different things start coming about that you have to bring to mind and realize that in a relay, it doesn't matter how fast you are as an individual. It doesn't matter how strong you are as an individual. It doesn't matter how well you ran your race as an individual. Unless you're doing it together as one team, can you be victorious? Can you be able to achieve the victory and avoid defeat? Can you be able to be perfect like it says? And then we have to remember and realize that if we forget that there were others that came before us, then we'll forget about those that are going to come after us as well. We're going to forget about them and we're not going to consider them. So we have to think about this that only together we're going to win this race. Only together. Now, I had the privilege of being a, a coach the track coach and the cross-country coach for Hampton Christian Academy for about two and a half years there. And one year, we actually made it to state championships. We qualified for state championships in multiple categories and multiple events. And one of those was the 4x100. The 4x100. Now, give you for, there, I've got some in here that should know exactly what I'm talking about. But for others that don't know what the 4x100 is, that's a race where you have four team members, 14 members each running 100 meters to complete one lap, which is 400 meters. And then what they do is, dun, ta, da, da. look at what I have here. What they do is, is that the first runner starts off with a baton. I'm going to keep this one right here. I'm going to need these. They start off with a baton, and then they get to a point. There are three different points throughout the track where they get to a point and they pass off the baton. I was going to have some of my teenagers come up here, but they might say, uh, hey, come on up, Kaylee, Kelsey, Noah, come on up here. Noah's like, I don't run track. Come on up here. I want you to show the people, demonstrate something for them real quick. I'll, I'll, I'll bring them up on stage. That way you don't have to adjust the camera. Look at that. They're like, I'm never, ever coming again, Mom. Don't do this to me. Smile, you're on candid camera. <laughs> so, Kelsey's normally the starter of, her, of the race, right? Kaylee, we'll put you right here, facing that way. Noah, you get to be right here. We'll forget about the fourth person. I'm old, I'll be the fourth person. But what happens is that they would run 100 meters and then pass off the baton. And then that person would then keep running, 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 pass off the baton. And then that person would run, 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 and pass off the baton. And this person would finish the race. Now, that's how it works. You see that? You good? All right, ladies, thank you so much. <laughs> so the race would continue. So that's the structure about it. But now, those three points there, those are very important points. Those points are known as the changeover box. Now, within the changeover box, you have your acceleration, your acceleration zone, and you also have your exchange zone. But that's all that takes place within, all of this takes place within the changeover box. And the thing is that the handoff has to be seamless. You kind of saw them up here because they're just demonstrated, just passing it off. But the coaches know that we, they work hard on this to ensure that the handoff is done right. 
Because if you don't do the handoff properly, if it's not seamless in the exchange zone or in the changeover box, it will affect the rest of the race and it will determine whether you do achieve that victory or you do end up basically with defeat. Now, there are three ways, three ways that you can end up failing to achieve the victory in the changeover box. One way is to, you're getting ready to pass it off and you drop the baton. You drop the baton. I'll tell you that that year that we went to the state championship, we had an incredible team. That four by one relay team, they were very fast. They were very good. But what happened was the exchange between the second and the third runner in that handover box, or excuse me, that changeover box, what happened was when they went to pass it, they fumbled it, they got sloppy, and the baton fell. And not only did the baton fall, they tripped each other up, and they both fell. So we didn't lose that race because we were the slowest team there. We were very good. We lost the race because the baton fell. The baton fell. Now, in any race, if, if any of you have ever raced before, you know that the key to running is to gain momentum and to increase your speed. You got to run and you got to increase your speed. Well, the second way that you can mess up in the changeover box is to either focus so much on that exchange that you don't do it in a manner that you should, or you just become complacent where you're at and you slow down because you're like, all right, I got to do this. All right, I got to make sure. All right, I got to. Or you're thinking, you're, you're overconfident. You're like, yeah, it's going to take place. It's going to take place. It's going to take place. And little do you know that while you're focusing on all of that, being overwhelmed by all of that, you're being passed by everybody else. You're being passed. So what took place in the changeover box didn't help you because you slowed down and you lost momentum. Now, finally, the last way. The last way that you can mess up is to actually do the exchange outside the changeover box, outside. So what that means is that, let's say, the end is down there at that point, and I'm running, I'm running, the runner's in front of me, I'm running, running, and I decide to hang on to the baton. I decide to hang on to the baton, and then I feel like passing it off, but I've already come outside the changeover box. That's only 20 meters. The distance is only 20 meters that you have to do that exchange, that you have to do that handoff. So basically what I'm saying is that you did the change too late and you weren't able to pass off the baton when you were supposed to and therefore you lost the race. So what's the point of all of this? You all are like, okay, he gave me such a track lesson here. What does he think? He's back in school training people or doing something? No. The point is that the scripture says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also Crossroads, let us also make sure that we carry our baton of faith. Let us make sure that we pass on faith to future generations in a proper way, that we don't end up dropping the baton, that we don't end up failing or slowing down so that we get passed by, and that we don't end up passing it on too late to other generations. Because you have to understand that as believers and as runners in this race, the baton of faith is in our hands, not just for our generation, but for other generations to come. For other generations to come. That's what I was doing here with Ethan, and I'll talk more about that. It's for other runners to come. If we don't attend services when we should... We're not passing on. We're not carrying our faith, and we're not passing on. If we're not serving when we should, if we're not giving when we should, if we're not loving when we should, if we're not forgiving when we should, if we're not showing mercy when we should, if we don't do it in that moment, in that changeover box, we're basically negating and missing out the opportunity to achieve victory. We're missing out the opportunity to achieve victory. Thank you for one amen. Come on, folks. I need you here today. We miss out on that opportunity. If you don't hand it off when you're supposed to at that appropriate moment, in the appropriate season, you can miss the divine opportunity for Christianity to accelerate, excel, and gain momentum. Amen. That's what I was doing with Ethan. That's what I'm talking about. How many pastors would put a 15-year-old to preach? 
When none of you have ever heard him before, when none of you have ever known, why? Because I knew the faith. I was carrying faith, and I'm trying to pass on something to him. I'm trying to pass on encouragement. I'm trying to pass on the word of God. I'm trying to pass on so much, not just to him, but to the entire youth. When I was in school, you're trying to pass on something that they can carry, hold, and continue for generations to come so that they can excel and gain momentum in their Christianity. In their Christianity, you see, the problem that we're experiencing nowadays is that Christianity has lost its momentum. Christianity has lost its momentum. We're having so many issues. We're experiencing so much in our culture, in our society, in our nation, in our world. I mean, there's so much chaos taking place. There's so much disunity and division, so much... Um, So much pain, so much suffering. All of these different things are taking place over and over again. But I want you all to know and please understand that the problem, you know, we like to focus on, on the different problems, but the problem is not a political issue. Oh boy, I said that from up here. That's just the branch. That's just the branch. The problem is not a cultural issue. That's just another branch. The problem is not a social issue. That's just the branch. The problem is not an educational issue. That's just the branch. The problem is not social media issues. I'm one that I'll tell you, oh my goodness, it's destroying, it's doing this or that. It's not an issue. What the issue is, what the root is, not the branch, is a faith issue. It's a faith issue. That's the issue that we're dealing with. And we have believers that are walking around or running around and choosing to fling their baton and can care less when we need believers that are ready to step up and stand up and say, I'm ready to run the race. I'm ready to do. I'm ready to endure. And I'm ready not only to carry the faith, but ensure that I pass it on to the next generation and for more generations to come. That I'm willing to carry this baton. That I'm willing to carry the good news of the gospel. That I'm willing to carry the light of God within me in the places of darkness to show it off to others. That I'm willing to do those things. Ready? I'm willing to bring it to my family. Willing to bring it to my workplace. Come on now. Willing to bring it to my community and even to the Supreme Court. Come on, put your hands together. Even if I have to, but willing to do these things. Now my question to you is, what will you do with your baton? What will you do with your baton? Will you just hold it? Will you drop it? Will you slow down with it? Will you fail to pass it on? when you need to. What will you do? You know, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, in Matthew 28, we're given the instructions regarding the Great Commission. The Great Commission, we're supposed to go. Go and make disciples. When I go, I'm carrying my baton. When I make a disciple, I'm passing on the baton. I'm passing it on to another generation so that they can continue and pass it on forward and forward again. Every time you're here, you're carrying your baton. Every time you pray, you're carrying your baton. Every time you worship, you're doing the same. Every time you give, you're doing the same. Every time you're carrying and you're passing on faith that's been stilled in you from the very moment that you said, Lord, enter into my heart. Every moment you're doing that. So we need to continue to do so. But what happens? What happens when we carry it and we fail to pass it on because we do that? What happens when we do those things? We basically miss on the opportunity for the eternal to touch the temporal. We miss out on that opportunity. Why? Let me bring you to the book of Judges, chapter 2, verses 7 through 10. This is an incredible uh, scripture that's actually a downing scripture when you think about it. It says there, and starting in verse 7, And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen, they had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance in timnath and in the country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Cash. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. Here's the key, folks. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, who did not know the Lord or the work he had done. 
That's why carrying your baton of faith is so important. That's why we don't stop meeting as a church. That's why we don't become complacent and comfortable with where we're at and the blessings that we see. And then we feel like we can kick back, relax, watch from home, not get engaged, not enter the community, not evangelize, not help the people, not do anything. That's why we don't do that because we have to realize that it's not just about us. It's not just about us. I mean, think about it. If you don't know who Joshua was, this is Joshua who was a slave in Egypt. He was a slave in Egypt. He was there during the time of Moses. He saw the plagues that took place. He saw the Red Sea part. He saw manna fall from the sky. I mean, him and his whole generation saw these things. They saw uh, God leading them through a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. They were there at the Jordan when the waters parted and they walked on dry ground. They were there when they were able to enter the promised land. Joshua and this generation saw Jericho walls come down. They saw all of this. And then they died. And it says that this other generation did not know the Lord and didn't know of his works. In other words, they didn't know about the miracles. Come on, Greg. They didn't know about the signs and wonders. They didn't know about anything that God did for them or that took place there. So what happened here is that somebody dropped the baton. What happened there, somebody dropped the baton. Somebody failed to pass on faith. Somebody failed to pass on what needed to be passed on. And now you're dealing with a generation that doesn't know what was going on or what took place. Legacies weren't shared. Faith wasn't encouraged. Momentum didn't continue. It all died and they achieved defeat instead of victory because they did not know the works of the Lord. They did not know. So what they were doing was these people, they were enjoying the fruit of Joshua's generation. They were enjoying their faith. They were enjoying their blessings, but they didn't exercise their own. They didn't exercise any faith of their own, and they failed to gain momentum. So as the scripture says, they were easily ensnared. They were easily ensnared. Folks, even now, even now, we're just one generation away from that. Even now, we're just one generation away from that. And then it says in Hebrews um, 12 again, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, I'm going to repeat this over and over again. It says, let us also lay aside every weight, every weight and sin that so easily ensnares us, that so easily ensnares us. For us to run with the baton, unhindered, untangled, we need to stop carrying weight and sin. And notice it's saying weight and sin, so it's two different things here. The scripture doesn't say to lay aside the weights of sin. It says to lay aside weight and sin. So in other words, if I explain to you weight, weight necessarily doesn't mean that it's a sin. I mean, consider this. Consider a weight like this. When I had surgery, you know, I had sur hernia surgery, I had to walk around with a crutch for a while. When I broke my ankles, I had to walk around with a cane and a crutch for a while. This helped me during a season. It helped sustain me. It helped lift me up. It kept me encouraged that I could move. But then as I got better, as I moved to another level, as I got stronger, I needed to let go of that cane. I needed to let go of that crutch because if not, I was carrying around dead weight. I was carrying around weight. Imagine trying to run a relay race or any race carrying a cane or carrying a crutch. Be like, okay, dude, why, why are you doing that? Let go of that. So that's an example for you right there on what a weight is. But guess what? A weight can also be certain people. Oh, boy. Are we getting deep now? Oh, my goodness. Everybody got quiet. And then it was like, oh, people look side to side like, he ain't talking about you, is he? He's not talking about me. A weight can be certain people. Now, once again, I said, I said it wasn't sin, but there could be certain people that are encouraging, right? They could be uplifting like that cane, like that crutch was. They could be uplifting and encouraging like, hey, brother, I'm glad you're doing good. I'm glad you got a job. I'm glad you, you're getting an education. I'm glad you're doing this. I'm glad you're doing that. In that season, they're there for you. But then these same people, when you start saying stuff like, I feel called to, to go to church, or I feel called to, to be in ministry, or I feel called to start a church. They're like, what are you talking about? 
All of a sudden, the encouragement dies. All of a sudden, the encouragement ain't there. And now they're saying stuff like, you don't really need to serve the Lord. I mean, really? You got to go to church every Sunday, and then you're talking about small groups on Wednesday, and then you probably pray. Man, that's just too much, man. That's just too much. There's too much. You got to slow down. You don't need to do all that. And then the scripture says that you got to do this, that you got to do that. I mean, all those rules, you don't have to follow all those rules. So now those same people that used to uplift you in one season, that used to encourage you in one season for the things of the world are now becoming a weight and an anchor to you with the things of God are now becoming an anchor for you for the things of God. So scripture says we have to lay it aside. Lay it aside. Okay, that one ain't popular. Let me go to another one that's not popular either. Your giving. Oh boy. Your giving can be a weight. And you're like, how is my giving a weight? Because you're giving at this level, right? You're giving at this level and God's saying, you know what? I want to do a financial breakthrough through your life. And you're giving at this level. But in order to get that breakthrough, you got to go to this level. So therefore, this level of giving, which isn't a sin, which is good, which is awesome, is keeping you from advancing. It's keeping you from gaining momentum. It's keeping you from accelerating in the things that God wants to put you in. So giving is another one, and then serving is another one. You know, we have many people in this church, I thank God for you, that as we've grown and as we've continued through this journey, that you serve in this church, that you serve in ministry, and then God is saying to others, all right, you're serving here, that's good, and that's not a sin, but in order to break through in this church, in order to break through in the community, in order to break through in the things that we need to do, you got to go to that next level, and you're allowing your service at this level to become an anchor to you and a weight to you. So we can look at this via so many different examples, but basically that weight, what I'm saying is something that was good in one season may become an anchor and a weight for you in the next season in order to propel you to go forward. Now, then the scripture talks about sin. So we talked about the weight and we talked about, or now we've got sin. And many people don't like to talk about sin in church, do they? Oh no, we don't talk about sin in church and better yet, we don't talk about what constitutes sin sin. What constitutes sins? And unfortunately, as a result of not wanting to talk about those things, there are lines being blurred as to what sin is and what sin isn't. They're being blurred so much that they have become what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Oh, come on now. I got one amen. We don't look at it as sin and no sin. We look at it as acceptable and not acceptable. And I have to tell you that there's a huge problem with that. A very big problem. You see, in our culture, there are things that are acceptable, but they're sin. They're also a sin. And in our culture, there are things that are not acceptable that are not a sin. Let me give you two quick examples. You ready? Sex before marriage. Acceptable, but sin. Prayer in school, here's the opposite now. Prayer in school, not acceptable, not a sin, not a sin, not a sin. So these are just some examples, but the lines are just so blurred as to what sin is and what sin is. And we have to get to the reality of what sin is and call it it. You know the old phrase, call a spade a spade, call sin a sin, and let's deal with it and get rid of it, versus to say, eh, it's not, it's not, and you know, and it continues to grow, it continues to grow, and before you know it, you're dealing with weeds, you're dealing with a mountain of stuff. I mean, it's like me doing landscape at the house. My wife will say, we need to take care of that, we need to take care of that, yeah, I'll get to it, yeah, I'll get to it, and all of a sudden, what I could have dealt with with a weed whacker, or what I could have dealt with with a hedge trimmer, now I got to bust out a chainsaw because it got so big and thick that it was just too much to deal with, and that's what we do with sin. We have to understand, and we have to get it right from the get-go, so we have to move beyond labeling stuff something different, something acceptable, and call it what it really is sin call it what it really is so I ask you all what do you need to lay aside what weight do you need to lay aside what sin do you need to lay aside you see we're all going to need to drop some things we're all going to need to drop some things as long as it's not the baton we all need to drop certain thoughts we need to drop certain habits we need to drop you know bitterness we need to drop unforgiveness we need to drop racism 
We need to drop division inside the church. I mean, in the church. We're not talking about out there. We're talking about in here. We need to drop unresolved issues. And then we need to drop unaddressed addictions and distractions. Oh, watch out with your amen. Ready? Because some are running a race before them. Let me pull out my phone for this one. Some are running a race before them, right? But they're too distracted and too busy scrolling through somebody else's race on social media that they're not looking at their own race before them. They're so busy with someone else's race that they're not concerned about their own race. You know that thing about the log in your eye? They're so busy with someone else's that they're not concerned with theirs. And what we need to do is forget about the other person's race and run our race. Run our race. In that leg that we were showing you here, when Kelsey's running her race, her concern is passing on the baton, not Kaylee's race. The same thing with Kaylee going to Noah. They are concerned about their individual race, but in the passing of the baton, then they're not worried about the next one because they did what they were supposed to do, pass on the faith. Pass on the gospel, pass on the, the prayers, pass on whatever they needed to pass on so that it can continue for generations to generations. If we stop being concerned with somebody else's race, then we won't be ensnared like the scripture says. We won't be hindered and we won't be entangled. Amen? Amen. Amen. Then in verse 2 it says, fixing your eyes on Jesus. So okay, we've dropped the weight. We've dropped the sin. We're running the race with endurance, but we have to look up to him. You know, some I tell the runners every time, don't look down while you're running. Look up. Look up. We have to continue to look up because Jesus is who we're looking up to. Jesus is the one on high that we're looking at at that finish line, that we're looking at at the destination, that we're looking at to hear those great words, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what we're looking for. That's what we want. Amen. So you need to realize the relay. That's the title of today's message, that you need to realize that you're in a relay, the relay that you're running in. So let me begin to wrap up with this. And you're all probably like, what? Uh, when I say I'm about to land, I'm about 30,000 up in the sky, so, you know, get ready. Now, this message, it may seem foolish to some. I mean, this guy's up there, you know, with these fake batons. I was actually going to ask you all to bring batons, and then I thought as much as I'm throwing them, all you hear is clang, 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 clang. This guy's up here, you know, with fake batons. He's throwing them around. They're flying all over the place. And then the thing is, is, get this. He's calling them batons of faith. Blasphemy! How dare he call it a baton of faith and not a shield of faith. You know, like we're taught in scripture. Foolishness. Total foolishness. This guy, never coming here again. Never tuning in again. But all I'm trying to do is encourage that we need to do like those mentioned in Hebrews 11. We need to do like those mentioned in Hebrews 11 who were considered foolish as well. They were considered foolish as well. You know, what may seem like foolishness to some, by faith, it's providing momentum and accelerating others to a higher level. It's accelerating others. So that's what I'm trying to do, accelerate you. I'm trying to get you to gain momentum. I'm trying to get you to see what we're in so you can run it accordingly. You see, Noah, Noah was considered foolish. How foolish did he look? He's building an ark, a huge ark. We're not talking about a little boat, John boat, you know, a little canoe that I have at home. No, you're talking about an ark with no rain. How foolish did he look? What about Moses? Moses, you know, he's got all these people with him, and all of a sudden he finds himself at a Red Sea with Egyptian armies behind them, and he's holding up a rod. People are looking at him like, dude, what are you doing? He looks so foolish to them. What about Sarah, who's in her later years, and she's saying, she's probably all excited, saying, hey, I'm about to have a baby, I'm going to have a baby. And they're like, woman, you foolish. What is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? Foolish. What about the Israelites marching around the walls of Jericho? You know, day after day, the first six days, nothing happens. You come back from marching, I'm like, <laughs> what in the world are you doing? Foolishness. Goliath to David like, David, you're just foolish. What is wrong with you? I mean, get me somebody who can really compete with me. You're just foolish. What about Mary? Mary, 
who's saying, hey, I'm going to give birth to the Son of God <laughs> as a virgin. Yeah, sure you are. Foolishness, foolishness. And then Jesus Christ, nailed to a cross, beaten, bloodied, thorn of crowns, or a crown of thorns. I speak the English perfect. Uh, around his head, and people looking at him like, that's the Messiah? And that's who you're counting? Foolishness. Foolishness. But 1 Corinthians 1.18 says this, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Who are perishing. But to us, how many of you are us? Yes. Amen. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So now let me ask you again, how many of you are us? Amen. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> how many of you are us? You know, our perceived foolishness by others is seeking God. Our perceived foolishness by others is, is praying. It's starting a church. I mean, how foolish did we look starting this church to others? It's worshiping, it's evangelizing, it's discipling so that people could be saved, so that people could be delivered, so that people could be healed all for God's glory. It's not foolishness, it's faithfulness. It's the power of God, as we're instructed in Scripture, it's the power of God. So we need to carry our batons like those people did mentioned in Hebrews 11. They did so not out of foolishness, but out of obedience out of obedience. So you see Noah and his family, they were saved from the flood. Moses, he got to see the Red Sea part and all of them were delivered through that and their enemies were defeated. Sarah, she did give birth in her latter years to Isaac. The Israelites, they did see Jericho walls come tumbling down. David, he did defeat a giant. Mary, she did give birth to the Savior and Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, he came off the cross, he conquered the grave, he rose again, and he sits at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. So it wasn't foolishness. It wasn't foolishness. So my Bible says, my Bible says that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the grave, the same spirit that rose him from death, lives on the inside of me. He lives on the inside of you. And that's the same spirit that's going to continue to strengthen us. So in the scripture where it says, therefore, for that reason, we can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. We can do all things. So let us crossroads as a church as a body of believers, as those connected with other churches, with people in our community, let's continue to run our race with endurance. Let's continue to run the race that is set before us. Let's continue to pass on faith. Let's continue to pass on the good news. Let's continue to pray for others. Let's continue to embrace one another. Let's continue to move forward in the things that God would have us do out of obedience, not out of necessity, but out of passing on so that future generations can receive, can hear about the goodness and greatness of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. 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 Come on, put your hands together. Let's stand to our feet. God is awesome, folks. God is awesome, and he's trying to encourage us. You know, yes, like I said, hey, cheap batons, cheap uh, analogy here or an example for you, but it needs to show you to serve a purpose that we're running in this together. Amen. We're in this together. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, so I thank you for your word, Father God. I thank you that it doesn't fall on deaf ears, Father, but that it encourages your people, Father. Those that are here and those that are watching online or listening to it, oh Lord, I thank you that it's increasing and increasing faith so that they gain momentum wherever they find themselves in, Father God. I know that sometimes in a race, you start getting a cramp, you start feeling exhausted, you start feeling tired, your head starts to shake, you start wondering, why am I doing this? I need to quit, I need to quit. Well, Father, I thank you 
that rise right now with the spirit that lives within them, that you would encourage them, that you would comfort them so that they can endure and continue in the race that they're in, that they will not quit, that they will continue and pass on what God has placed within them to pass on to others, Father God, so that they would go forth and continue to achieve victory in this race, Father. The relay, the relay, Lord. Father, I just pray that you would meet everyone where they're at, Father God. We've all walked in here with our own concerns, our own situations, Father God, and I say that you would grant them peace right now. Father, that they would be able to lay aside every weight, that they would be able to lay aside every sin, Father God, and to be able to then rise up, Father, and stand up for you, O Lord, because you're the one that strengthens them. You're the one that guides them, and you're the one that leads them, O Lord. So I just thank you for this time that we have together, Father God. May we leave these doors not the same way we came in, Father God. May we leave encouraged to continue in the journey that you've set before us, Father God, so that we too can hear those famous words, well done, my good and faithful servant. So we honor you this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on. So folks, many are waiting for your baton. Many are waiting for your baton. So carry it right, pass it on, run well. And until the next time, I look forward to seeing you all here at the crossroads. God bless you all.